Hello and welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zepp LaRouche. She is the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. It's December 6, 2023, and I'm Harley Schlanger. I'll be your host today. You can send us your questions and comments to the Schiller Institute, I'm sorry, to questions at the Schillerinstitute.org, or you can post them in the YouTube chat room. Helga, with the end of the ceasefire in Gaza, the world is witnessing an escalation of the brutal attack by the Netanyahu regime on the Palestinian civilian population in Gaza, allegedly in an effort to exterminate Hamas. There have been diplomatic initiatives, there have been numerous statements condemning the Israeli operations, but so far no action has been taken to enforce a ceasefire. Uh, the, the first question for you is that in several recent conferences and statements you've made, you've emphasized that while, uh, it, while necessary, a ceasefire in itself is not a guarantee of peace, and that your late husband's OASIS plan is essential for peace and security in Southwest Asia. Now, this question seems to come from someone from the Henry Kissinger School of Diplomacy, who asks, isn't it necessary to first reach a political agreement before trying to solve economic problems? Well, I think that that is uh, <clears throat> the reason why many of these agreements uh, have not functioned, because you know it is a wrong idea that you first need a political solution before you can start with an economic reconstruction program. It has to be the other way around, <clears throat> because I mean, what is the situation in, in Gaza and the West Bank, but especially Gaza right now? <clears throat> I think the reports which are coming in now by the hour are the most incredible, heartbreaking. I don't find words to describe it because people have been told to go to this southern city of uh, <clears throat> Khan Yunis, uh, then that place was bombed. Now they are being told to go to Fatah. Then that has been bombed. Then they are being told to go to a tiny spot <clears throat> at the southernmost part of the border with uh, Egypt, where <clears throat> you know an unbelievably large number of people is supposed to be, uh, you know, concentrated. And I think that word has a special meaning. In, in a tiny place and no water, no medicine, no food, continuous bombardment. I mean, if one imagines what people are going through, um, I think that, you know, whoever is thinking that you are solving the problem of terrorism this way, better thinks twice. Uh, there is a debate right now in Israel itself where some people are saying that, you know, the uh, proud, in quote, uh, reports that uh, only two civilians were killed for one Hamas, uh, <clears throat> that that would be a, a good result, um, that that calculation is completely wrong, that there is the obvious uh, danger that, you know, if this continues, and you're not even allowed to, to say the things which you are thinking anymore, because there are laws being made which immediately label you in, in ways which, which is not justified at all, uh, for one terrorist, ten, uh, one Hamas person killed, 10 terrorists will emerge. And so if uh, the Israelis were able to kill so far 5,000 Hamas, <clears throat> uh, this is a guess, I, I suppose, uh, then <clears throat> there would be already, um, you know, something like 100,000 new people uh, swearing revenge. So this hike has to be interrupted. I mean, there is no way how the security of Israel can be guaranteed because, you know, what is clearly uh, a danger is that this whole situation expands to Lebanon, Hezbollah, to Syria, where, you know, many groups are uh, basically in, in increasing tensions, um, actually t more than tensions with American troops, the same in Iraq. Then the question is, uh, what will happen with Iran if this continues? <clears throat> so I think, you know, we are looking at a, at a complete horror show, a powder keg. Uh, I think that some action needs to be done immediately. Now, obviously, the most efficient would be 
if the United States would just say we stop all weapons and money to Israel, and then it would stop. That is the opinion of many people, even coming from Israel, <coughs> expressing that. Um, so since that is not <coughs> very likely right now, <coughs> what we have been um, trying to introduce in the situation is a dynamic which gives hope to the whole region. The OASIS plan uh, is uh, an economic development perspective to transform this entire region, which is essentially desert, 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 into an area where through the help, with the help of a system of canals from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, Red Sea to the Dead Sea, and then have large scale desalinization of this salty water for irrigation of agriculture, for the building of infrastructure, even building new cities, industrialization. And this is eminently possible because uh, you have practically, you know, the uh, proposals by China uh, to extend the Belt and Road Initiative into the entire region uh, to um, <clears throat> pick up on the Chinese proposal to have a Mideast comprehensive peace conference in which you know, a settlement of uh, the crisis could take place with the recognition of a two-state sol solution, uh, but then you need economic development. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, I mean, given the fact that neither the United States nor Israel are willing to do this right now, the only way uh, I can imagine that we arrive there is we have to get all the neighbors, all the uh, countries, you know, in, in the region and all the Islamic countries to demand that. Now, this is not very far away because, you know, just today, President Putin of Russia is on a state visit in the United Arab Emirates. He already met uh, with the head of state there. He has a very large delegation, including uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov and many others with him. And they're meeting with a similar delegation from the Arab Emirates, uh, they have a huge uh, bilateral uh, trade uh, volume, and you know then he then Putin will go to meet with uh, the head of Saudi Arabia, Al Salman. Then he will go to Iran. Now the significance of that is that all these three countries will be full members of the BRICS plus on January first. That's only three weeks away. And, you know, given the fact that, you know, these countries are all relevant in terms of the oil price, the amount of oil which is being produced uh, on a daily basis, I think there are many factors which are favorable uh, that such a proposal could be realized. But what needs to be done foremost is you have to have a perspective where all the people, as horrible as the situation is, have a future, have a hope. And by spreading this uh, idea of having an oasis plan, you know, we are trying to, to put a completely different agenda on the table. And, uh, you know, I can only ask all of you who are watching this discussion, you should help us download our oasis plan, <clears throat> get it to all lawmakers, to all congressmen, to all parliamentarians, mayors, and other elected officials other organizations, because we have to saturate the whole world with the idea that we need a dramatic change in policy if this is not supposed to become the, you know, the, <clears throat> the development to World War Three, which it could very well be. Now, we just got a question in, in the context of, of your answer there. Uh, someone asks, is there any chance that the Westphalian approach to mutual respect of sovereignty might be effectively honored in the current colonial mentality that drives Western policies? Well, <clears throat> I think so, yes, because, I mean, the West is uh, really trying to keep the status quo of the old, formerly unipolar world order, which already has disintegrated into a multipolarity, and that is not the final stage of this development, I think what we are seeing is a historic development, which you know probably in history occurred several times. That 
the those people who were the privileged of a de decaying, collapsing order somehow have a mental block to realize that they are losing, that they have, I think that, you know, already now, the fact that many Western governments did not bring it about them to condemn what is happening right now, despite the fact that it's so, so absolutely obvious and, and, and horrible, you know, only a few, you know, like the prime minister of um, um, Spain, and the Prime Minister of Belgium, when they recently went uh, <clears throat> to the border crossing in Fatah, uh, they demanded, you know, a two-state solution. And uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister Sanchez of Spain even said that Spain may recognize the Palestinian state unilaterally if there is not a, an appropriate action coming from the rest of the European leaders. So I think that, you know, what you are seeing right now is that parts of the establishment, the vast majority of it, are obviously incapable to see that their very action are causing their demise. I mean, what is happening now in Gaza is, I think it will discredit the West in ways which you know cannot be remedied because if you allow something like this to happen, I think it will it, it will be burned into the memory of so many people around the world. And it will, in my view, it will absolutely increase the determination by the countries of the global south to develop their own economic system, to end colonialism once and for all. And I think that given the fact that the transatlantic financial system is in a real crisis. I mean, it's basically sitting there as a powder keg ready to explode. <clears throat> I don't think the West is in such a strong position to prevent the desire of the developing countries to form a new system, which is in their benefit. But it's highly dangerous, you know, because the only I, I think the only thing which could happen is that it completely blows up. And that could lead to the end of civilization. But I don't think that there is any way how this present system of suppression of the aspiration of the global South that cannot last. Well, on the relationship between the continuation of war, but at the same time, the lack of money to fund it, which is hitting a number of countries, including the United States, we have a question. Someone wrote in about Schumer's dog and pony show hearings that he was going to have a hearing yesterday bringing in Zelensky to make a personal, uh, powerful appeal for more money from the Congress, and, and Zelensky didn't show up. So the question is, given the growing opposition in Congress to Biden's supplemental budget bill of $106 billion for Ukraine and Israel, what are the implications of this fight? What if the U.S. doesn't send more money to Ukraine? What will happen? Well, I think that there is already a very far reaching recognition that Ukraine lost the war. And that's a fact. Um, you know, the famous counteroffensive did not succeed at all. Uh, all the weapons which were sent led only to an unbelievable carnage, the destruction of the Ukrainian economy. And there is right now a recognition that something else has to come. Uh, and that you need to somehow get out of this <clears throat> with somehow a face saving operation. And, you know, so there are some people, complete war hawks, who want to continue this uh, disregarding what will be the effect on the Ukrainian population, which is bleeding to death. Uh, but <clears throat> I think that um, I don't have the latest insight on why Zelensky made this decision not to go, but there is massive opposition against uh, him continuing the way the war went from inside Ukraine. I mean, there are some of his closest advisors who are no longer believing that this can be won. So I think that the sooner the idea of negotiations and ending this horrible war uh, with, with a peace agreement, including, you know, the interest to take care of the interest of Russia and Ukraine, which is what Putin had demanded on December 17th in 2021, 
you know, where he made an ultimatum. He said to NATO and the United States that they should give legally binding uh, security guarantees, uh, and then this whole thing would not have happened. But you know, so I think we are now at a at a point where you know the Ukraine war is coming to an end because the people are simply not not there any longer. And the more quickly the West recognizes uh, that you know it it has to come to an end. Naturally, this is a big factor. The election campaign in the United States is, um, you know, approaching, and many people, you know, really, um, you know, know that the war is not popular in in the, in the electorate in the United States. So hopefully, you know, there are some people inside the United States establishment, because I cannot imagine that you know the the U.S. policy has not been successful since Vietnam. Look at all these wars. Vietnam was lost. Afghanistan was lost. Iraq, Libya, Syria, an endless line of, of, of failed efforts to impose policies which were always detrimental against the interest of the relevant uh, country. And the sooner this idea of interventionist wars stops, the better. And I think that, you know, for example, take Afghanistan, if only 3% of the, I think, $2.3 trillion, which the United States spent in the 20 years, the US and NATO were in Afghanistan, only 3% would have spent on an annual basis. There are estimates, you know, that the, the country would be a flowering garden and there would be industry and infrastructure. And the same is true, you know, I mean, all this money for these endless wars is a complete destruction of physical economy. And that money wasted it, going into the pockets of the speculators and the military industrial complex, naturally, but otherwise, from the standpoint of the uh, general public wasted, if that money would go into schools, into health systems, into infrastructure, everybody would be served so much better. And I can only say that we need a mobilization demanding exactly that, uh, that such a shift has to occur. We are listening to Helga Zapp-LaRouche, the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute, who is also very actively involved in pulling together the International Peace Coalition. And we'll have posted on our website information on how you can participate in that. Now, Helga, we have a couple of other questions related to the COP28 conference. Uh, someone wrote in and said, thank you for your constant exposure of the green agenda and that it's a depopulation agenda. Uh, the, the fight is going on in the COP28 conference over fossil fuels. What do you think is the significance of India's refusal to agree on reducing the use of coal? Does, does that have a broader impact on the overall green agenda? Well, I think it's a, a fact you can, in the, there has been a tremendous push to go for nuclear energy, which is exactly what needs to be done. Uh, there's a whole group of countries now, you know, forming a nuclear club with the idea to build up nuclear energy as quickly as possible. But there will be a period, a gap, you know, because you cannot build nuclear plants overnight. It takes uh, years. And, you know, there is now very promising the first fourth generation reactor, uh, which China is uh, going to put online. So there are huge development in the field of nuclear energy, and that is very, very promising. But you do need coal for the interim uh, period. And I think the fact that India simply says this will have a very important impact on all the other uh, countries of the global south. Now, I think this COP28 um, summit uh, was really incredibly um, instructive. Not only did the organizer um, basically say that they have no intention to leave fossil fuels, which caused a huge uh, up uh, outcry, uh, but also, you know, the, the fraudulent character of the whole thing was becoming clear. There were almost 100,000 people flying into uh, Dubai um, and, you know, all the CO2 emissions from all these planes, you know, if you, I mean, you can imagine. And then what was accomplished actually very little. 
And I, I must say, you know, whenever people say something right, one should praise them. And I think Greta Thunberg, uh, who is now being slaughtered by the international media, uh, you know, brought up the fate of the Palestinian people. And, you know, I think this is very, very important because, you know, once people recognize that something is going awfully wrong and they have the courage to say it, you know, that's uh, definitely probably one of the better outcomes of this COP28 summit. Well, speaking, speaking of people doing things wrong, there's another question on the general uh, fossil fuel fight, the energy fight. Uh, someone writes in, what is going on in Europe and the EU with the disagreements over the green agenda? And what about the situation in Germany? Uh, will there be energy shortages this winter? Uh, is there any way the Germans can somehow revive the flow of gas and oil from Russia? Well, the German economy right now <clears throat> is in a free fall. And, you know, the media is not reporting it as a comprehensive uh, picture. But every day you find in the German media a little uh, statement from this CEO or that head of an association saying my sector is collapsing. And, you know, I think if one puts this together, Germany is absolutely the bottom falling out. And, you know, many firms say that they have to lay off uh, people or, or invest in other countries. Naturally, there is economic warfare from the United States against Germany uh, by, you know, luring those firms who no longer can afford the high energy prices in Germany to reinvest in the United States uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, providing them certain privileges. So this is not the act of a friend, this is the act of an enemy. And given the fact that the Nord Stream 2 sabotage is still the big question to be investigated, <clears throat> you know, Simon Hirsch's uh, allegations have not been really countered. Uh, so I think, you know, it is really the time for Germany to draw the conclusions out of it. Do we want to let our entire economy, everything which was built in the post-war period, you know, in generations of work, do we let that disintegrate, collapse, take apart? I mean, this is a crisis moment for Germany as, as you know, in, in, in one hasn't seen in terms of economics since the end of World War II. Now, interestingly is that uh, Putin a couple of days ago uh, basically said <clears throat> that, you know, he is regretting that the relationship between Russia and, and Germany has gone to such a sour point and that, you know, if Germany would make up their mind, uh, there would be a way of, of resuming uh, the relation. These are not exactly his words, but uh, the general meaning. <clears throat> and I think that that is indeed what Germany should do. We should just, you know, go uh, again and say we need the cheap Russian uh, gas in particular. And, you know, that would be the reasonable thing to do. So I think this winter depends, you know, if it started very cold, uh, now, it all depends if the winter gets very hard and a lot of energy consumption will be needed. I think we may come to an absolute crisis point uh, because also the all the other economic parameters are looking absolutely horrible. So I think Germany will be confronted with the choice of either collapsing, you know, under the uh, operations of an ally, our so-called best ally, the United States, or we think in terms of our own population and uh, basically reopen the gas uh, deliveries from Russia. Well, Helga, I, I looked out the window today, the skies are gray, there's been no sun in about three weeks here in, in uh, the Berlin area, and all the solar panels are covered with snow. So I, I think that tells you something about the natural law asserting itself against the idiocy of the Greens. I have one more question for you, which comes from someone who uh, says they're very hopeful about the possibility that religion could be a factor in a ceasefire and, and peace. 
Uh, they reference that uh, Sergei Lavrov has talked about post-Christian culture in the West. And this person writes, is it possible that around Christmas time, this offers a chance to recognize the significance of love of our fellow man as the basis for peace? Well, uh, I can only say that, that uh, all people of goodwill are called upon to try to evoke that sentiment in their and our fellow citizens. Because, you know, I think that apart from the horrible war in Ukraine, the horrible situation in, in the Middle East, um, we have a real crisis of Western culture. I think we are looking at a complete decadent collapse. <clears throat> it's hard to say if one should compare it with the end of the Roman Empire or the 14th century or other periods of, of total collapse and decadence of the elites. And, you know, I think that, you know, we need to find in ourselves that which is human in us. And we have to, you know, build on that and create hope. And, you know, I mean, the human species right now is undergoing uh, such a profound crisis. And I think both religions, you know, religious uh, leaders, but also people who are truly religious uh, uh, people, should use this uh, holiday season, Christmas and the other uh, holidays to uh, evoke, you know, the love for humanity and try to get back to a human society. I think that, you know, if we get through this crisis, I think we will go through a, you know, period of maybe a year, one and a half years, two years. This is a period where I think a lot of processes will come to their point of exhaustion, a breaking point, a transition point. And if we manage to somehow get enough people with the idea that there is a solution, the West should stop to be arrogant and, you know, think that they can continue the colonial order, which really is at the bottom of all of this, you know, and we should stop this, I would say, Eurocentric arrogance, which includes the United States. I mean, you can call it America-centric arrogance, Euro Eurocentric arrogance, to think that we are something better and that the countries of the global south of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, that they are somehow inferior. Because I think that that is really, maybe if you would ask people, they would not think that they are racist. But if you look at their behavior, in terms of the kinds of institutions they want to perpetuate, which would perpetuate the uh, lack of development of the Southern Hemisphere, then you have to come to the conclusion that it is this Eurocentric racist attitude which is behind a lot of what's going on. And there is a time now to get rid of that, to have a catharsis and remind ourselves of the true tradition of America, which is the American Revolution, the founding fathers, uh, what Benjamin Franklin was saying, what John Quincy Adams was saying, or in Europe, the Italian Renaissance, the Andalusian Renaissance, the French Polytechnique, the German classical period, the image of man, which is associated with Schiller, with Beethoven, with the Ninth Symphony, which was the composition of Beethoven of Schiller's poem, Ode to Joy where the idea is all men become brethren. Now, I think that that is not a utopia. I think that that is the absolute precondition for civilization to survive. And I think Christmas and this whole period is a period where all people of goodwill, religious or not religious, must work together to evoke that if you want to come out of this crisis. Well, I have an idea for people for a Christmas present. They can go to the LaRoucheOrganization.com and download the Oasis Plan pamphlet and get that around the Christmas tree and get people discussing it. Uh, this is what Helga has been discussing today. And, and this is the basis of a lasting peace, which is in the spirit of Christmas and all other religions that have celebrations this time of year. So Helga, that's all the questions I have for you. Uh, wait, hold it. Here comes one. 
A last question. Uh, what you're describing as Eurocentric arrogance, is that the essence or the basis of geopolitics? Uh, yes. Um, it, it's the idea that, you know, you have, it really started way, way back in 1500 when the idea of colonialism began. And you have to look at the 600 years following that period. But in the recent period, I think it was associated with the Wolfowitz doctrine. This was when the Soviet Union disintegrated and, you know, there was the basis for peace. You could have built a peace order for the 21st century then, which we attempted with proposing the Eurasian land bridge. But at that time you had uh, Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and various other neocons who defined this idea that, you know, with communism being uh, defeated, so they said it was the wrong conception to think that they were victorious over communism. Uh, but they came up with the idea that, you know, the United States should never allow any group of nations to bypass them economically, militarily, or culturally. And that, you know, that was really a lot of what went wrong. Uh, because what the United States should have done was to go back to the peace policy of John Quincy Adams or John F. Kennedy and say, you know, we work with an alliance, a partnership of, of countries around the world uh, and cooperate. And I think that that idea to replace confrontation with the aim to keep the unipolar world, which has gone since long anyway, and change that into a mode of cooperation that is the most urgent uh, thing today to do. Well, Helga, thank you for joining us today. And with all good luck and everything else, we'll see you again next week. Yes, and join the International Peace Coalition.